Today on the show, I have the pleasure of speaking with David Robinson. Now, David is the CEO and founder of Canovo Capital and is an active real estate investor, broker, and podcast host. Now, as a broker and an investor, David has been directly involved with over $300 million of real estate transactions. He has a top leading producing real estate sales teams and has managed leading national fran franchise brokerage firms in the state of Utah. At Canovo Capital, David oversees all due diligence, acquisitions, capital raising efforts, and investor relations. Uh, to make sure that he is getting the best returns for his investors and making sure he's introducing investors to the best types of deals. I'm really pumped and excited to have him on the show today to share his incredible knowledge and insight with us. But enough of me, let's get him out here. G'day, David. Welcome to the show. How are you doing today, mate? Doing great, Reed. Welcome. Uh, thank you for having me on the show. I, I'm <laughs> honored to have a chance to chat with you. You know, we had you on the podcast uh, a month or two ago and looking forward to our conversation today. Yeah, it's always interesting when the host becomes the guest and you just go <laughs> back into the mindset of welcome. Oh, no, 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 I'm on someone else's show. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> so, love it. Mate, without, without further ado, we ask all my guests on this show to rewind the clock and tell me how you made your first ever dollar as a kid. First ever dollar as a kid, goodness gracious, wow. I have to think back on that one, but what I will tell you is this, um, when I realized that I was destined for more of an entrepreneurship route, uh, I was uh, recently graduated from high school and uh, was working for my dad's uh, mechanical engineering firm. And uh, and I had was tasked with this, pretty simple task of like binding these big calc books that he used back in the day. And I bound like three of them in a row incorrectly. And uh, we had a, a, a one of those moments, those employee and dad moments where he was like, look, this is not working out. He ended up firing me that day. It was more of a mutual firing, but that was the moment I realized, my goodness, I don't know that I'm employable and I probably have to uh, go more of an entrepreneurship route. So. Is that the start of when the entrepreneurship bug bit you? Yeah, that was actually the moment that I decided, you know what? Um, I think I'm going to uh, go get a real estate license. I was still going to school, but uh, decided to go get a real estate license in Phoenix, Arizona. Uh, ended up getting that real estate license and that really kicked off my real estate career. And you didn't want to follow the path of the old man, you know, mechanical engineering, mate. I'm sure man, that there, was, there was there was too much math involved in mechanical engineering, and uh, that's not my jam. So I hey, yeah, hey. went a different path. As a former structural engineer, my friend, it's uh, it's it's an, you know, engineers are cut from a different cloth. I, I can definitely tell you that you've got yes, to be really are. into your numbers to make sure that you're uh, you like what you do. Because ultimately, I got out of engineering because of that. It was great with numbers, but I didn't want to be a small cog in a big machine. Excuse the pun with uh, mechanical engineering. <laughs> <laughs> but mate, tell me, what, what have you been building over the last couple of years? You know, you, you mentioned earlier that you, you got your brokerage license. What yeah. Walk us through the path of, of this road that you've been on uh, building something from scratch. Yeah, well, I mean, it's been 18 years at this point. Um, uh, the first 10 years of my career was really focused in the foreclosure prevention and short sell space as a real estate broker. I was helping clients that were, you know, in a tough situation leading up to and through the recession. And so built one of the uh, top uh, short sell and foreclosure prevention firms here in the state of Utah. And then uh, as the market started to shift to more of a traditional market, I pivoted back to traditional residential resale and built up a real estate sales team, small team that would focus on just helping your typical client. I focused mainly on the sales management side and leading and, and managing the sales team and less on the sales side. Um, and then eventually was recruited to run a, a, a national franchise brokerage, a traditional residential brokerage. Um, what happened after a decade or more of being in that space, I realized, I looked back and I realized I had not done nearly enough on the investing side of my life and uh, hadn't built up any significant cash flow or wealth in my world. And so I knew I needed to change that. I had four kids and really wanted to, you know, provide them. Uh, or build upon what my parents had built uh, built for me or, or set me on a path, uh, the foundation that they, they had set for me. And I wanted to build on that and help my kids uh, in, in the same way. And so I really decided to pivot. I shut down everything I was doing on the residential side of the business, opened a boutique 
uh, brokerage here in Utah that was focused exclusively on serving clients that are looking to buy small scale multifamily property for their own personal portfolios. And by small scale, I'm referring to roughly anything under $5 million all the way down to your typical fourplex. And so that's what I set out to do. And that's what we've been focused on over the last handful of years. And then uh, more recently, uh, you know, as I had opportunity to have conversation after conversation after conversation with these investors or would be investors who thought they wanted to buy those, you know, small scale multis, they uh, would relay to me that in reality, they didn't want to own that duplex, that fourplex, that 12 plex, that 24 plex. They just wanted the benefits of owning real estate and they thought that that was the best path. And that's when I started to set out to learn more about passive investing in real estate syndications and how I might be able to help my investors participate in those. So today our business is pretty simple. We still have our brokerage here locally in Utah and we continue to serve buy and hold investors that are looking to acquire small scale multifamily property for their own personal portfolios. And then we also uh, partner with great operators like you, Reed, and uh, help our investors participate in large scale commercial multifamily syndications and invest passively in those. That's that, that's incredible. And I love the balance between a brokerage firm. Don't go, you know, punch the gifted horse in the mouth, so to speak. It's probably providing still a really good income for you and your family. You, you built a name for yourself locally, but you're then coupling it with other conversations that you're having around the, the water cooler, so to speak, in that what how could you help your clients do more with what they want to go out and achieve? And I see so many people in this podcast coming on and combining those, you know, not just brokerage, but but other facets in life, you know, accounting, or it might be legal, or it might be, you know, engineering, or, you know, whatever it might be, that you're combining the two to create, you know, uh, an investment platform, but also, you know, on the, on the practical side of, of helping people in your local area, you know, just be a, a service-based business, which is what you are. Um, talk to me about how that has how that has a transitioned for you in those conversations. Was it tough in the beginning to to, to say, "Hey, don't worry about this," you know, this locally. Let's look at a, a deal in Texas, or let's look at a deal in Florida. Yeah, that's a great question. It really was natural. It was it was me trying to solve a problem for my investor base. Uh, time after time, I would have a conversation with an investor who would come to me and say, you know, I think I would like to buy this property. And the conversation would go down the road of, all right, well, how much time do you have to manage this? Uh, how much energy do you have to put into this property and oversee it? Whether you're self-managing or whether you're managing the manager, there's still active involvement in these type of deals. And many of the conversation I'd have would be with busy professionals, uh, business owners, who in reality, they didn't have the time nor the desire or the wherewithal to go and buy their own property and manage their own small portfolio. And so naturally as a byproduct, they would be asking me about, well, could I just partner with you on a deal? Hmm. And, uh, and the question became, well, how could I do this on a larger scale and help more of my investors to get what they want, which is they want to have some of their investment in real estate and they want to not have to deal with all the headaches and hassles and challenges of personal ownership or personal management. And so uh, the conversations were actually natural and it was me trying to solve a problem uh, for those investors. And that's when I set out to really explore and build relationships with you know uh, uh, operators all across the country and go through a process of trying to get to know them, trying to understand the syndication model. That wasn't even being in the real estate world, you'd be surprised. You know, there's so many people that have no idea what a real estate syndication is or even how they're even structured or, or what the benefits are or the drawbacks are. And so for me, I spent about a year just investigating, learning, talking to people, interviewing people on the podcast. And uh, ultimately, um, eventually, after sort of testing the waters with my investor network, asking them, you know, I had a thesis early on. A lot of my investors not only wanted to be passive, but they also wanted to be able to participate in cash flow deals or, or deals that would produce a better blend of both cash flow and appreciation. Whereas what I was showing them here in Utah, what was available for them to buy was heavy, heavy on uh, appreciation and really lean on cash flow. And they just wanted to have that, that comfort level of having good solid cash flow that I couldn't provide them with local 
small scale multifamily. So that was another aspect. And so my thesis early on was I wanted to be in the Midwest. I wanted to work with an operator that was boots on the ground that had expertise in his local market. And so that's initially what I set out to look for. I found that. And uh, after about a year, uh, maybe 18 months of effort and really setting it up and and meeting the right people and understanding the process myself and partnering with the right person, uh, we did our first deal and, and had many of my uh, uh, members of my investor network participate in that first deal with us. And the actual question would be, why didn't you do something locally? But I think you answered it. But I've seen some syndicators actually do deals in Utah. So did you ever think to yourself, could you be the operator? Or did you always just sort of wanted to be that conduit between a good operator and, 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 and the equity? Yeah, I think eventually that could be the path that I go. Uh, at this point, I really prefer to partner with specialists in their area. Uh, I'm not an operator naturally. That's mm. not... The, you're, not, the you're, not the, that, you're not you're not dad's engineer, right? <laughs> <laughs> I have some of those tendencies, but not at that level. And so I know what my skill set is and I know what I'm great at and and staying focused on what I am great at and and partnering with people that have those operational chops um, are really where, where I think the blend of of both skill sets are important. And so mm. that's what I set out to do. I'm not to say I'm not going to say that I'll never uh, go on the operation side of things. But, um, you know, I, I, I prefer, especially this early in my career, as it relates to real estate syndication and large scale commercial um, partnering with very experienced operators that have a track record of success are on a growth trajectory and have a ton of value to bring to the table in, in, in the form of systems, processes, and, uh, and just, uh, you know, uh, performance, past performance was very, very important to me. Yeah, no, I, I completely agree. And that's for a lot of people out there when they're building this business of capital raising and, you know, understand, trying to teach their investors what to do, you try to do it all. But, you know, doing it all maybe not may not necessarily be the right path because you, you sort of back to what you've built with your local brokerage firm. It's still a really good source of income. You don't want to give that up and you're good at it. Right. So, so why yeah. so why why have to do wear all the all the hats, so to speak? And that's the beauty of syndication is that you can there's so many options to wear different hats and, and partner up with different people um, to, to allow your investor base to your benefits, you know, participate in the benefits of real estate without actually having to be an active owner, you know, which is what you've experienced firsthand. Um, tell me, uh, how have you seen, I want to sort of pivot a little bit to the overall market. You know, what are you seeing uh, since you, you've been in the business for since 2000, early, the late 2000s, um, you, be, you built it coming out of the recession. Now, I want to ask a couple of questions around like, what are you seeing locally for, for, for just your brokerage firm? And then we'll pivot on to later what you're seeing in the syndication world um, and the appetite for that. So let's just start with your the local hunger for just small multifamily. And what are you seeing the average investor buying in the Utah market? And has it slowed down? Has it dried up? And, and how has financing affected that? Yeah. So all great questions. And uh, again, just for context, I want to reiterate my my. Uh, niche is in the small scale multifamily. So we're talking under $5 million. So not mm -hmm. your typical uh, syndication or large scale commercial. So these are usually private investors, individuals that are using their own funds to go and buy their own property for their own personal portfolio. Maybe they're exchanging out of another asset and getting into multifamily. So just for context, that, that's what we focus on. Thank you As it that. relates to that business and that business model, um, it's shifted dramatically. You know, uh, we would have a, a 12 plex that we would put on the market and literally wouldn't even have to put it to market. And we would have multiple offers just inside of our own network. Right. Whereas uh, more recently, since the rate hikes, uh, that's slowed down dramatically. Now, what I will say is that I don't have any indication that there's a uh, going to see, a, at least initially, a big shift in pricing. I'm not seeing big mm. shifts in pricing. What I am seeing is less demand and less inventory. And so I think what that is resulting in is uh, lower velocity. So the number of sales and the speed at which these sales are happening has reduced dramatically. Whereas uh, I haven't seen a big shift in pricing yet. I will say that there is a discrepancy between what buyers and lenders are willing and able to do and what sellers want. And so that is you know, still some friction there. And I. I don't know when that will resolve. Um, 
I expect that sellers will just have to come to reality and either they won't be sellers anymore or they'll realize, my goodness, the gains that I've achieved over the last you know, five years have been phenomenal. And even though I may not be getting the premium that I would have six to eight to 12 months ago, it still makes sense for me to potentially look at selling. And that's all circumstantial. It's like, well, what are they going? The biggest challenge that they face, that sellers face is, well, what am I going into? Mm. Because as a private investor, it's less about just cashing out and then, you know, going in and buying another asset like you would in the syndication space. It, it really is like, can I find something that's going to perform as good as my existing asset is? And that's a question that we often, you know, run into with our with our investors is they've built up a significant amount of equity in their current portfolio. And that equity is most likely underperforming at this point. They haven't re, they haven't ran any type of return on equity analysis and determined, my goodness, I'm actually only getting a five to eight percent return on equity. Right. So then the question then becomes, well, what should we be doing? And it's really a course of action of three different potential strategies. The first is you sit tight and you enjoy what you have. Uh, number two is you look to potentially refinance and try to recapitalize that asset and then go take that equity and go redeploy it or reposition it elsewhere. And that's a challenge right now because, you know, w rates where they're at. And thirdly, it's uh, it doesn't make sense to potentially sell and then reposition this equity. Again, the biggest challenge is what am I going into and can I find an opportunity that's going to perform as well as what I currently have? So uh, it, it overall is... I don't see a big um, a, a, a big correction in pricing yet as it relates to the market, but I am seeing uh, a discrepancy between buyers and sellers and the velocity of sales. I I will echo that, and um, for everyone who's listening, you know I I keep my finger on the pulse through a couple of masterminds I'm involved with, but also talking to local brokers in my markets. And we're seeing exactly the same thing in Phoenix, in Texas, in South Carolina, and I've heard in Florida's other operators where you're getting that people are still, sellers are still thinking they're going to get prices from six months ago, but then you can't make it pencil because the debt market where it is. I, I actually, I'm on a best and final deal right now in Greenville, South Carolina. I put my, you know, 30, 40 days ago, I put in that, um, the LOI, it's come back around, you know, whatever. Um, or when I first underwrote, I should say, at the time we had mid five interest rates. I just went and got it repriced. I'm now in mid sixes going up to sevens. It completely changes my deal and my offer and best and finals next week. I may have to bow, bow out. I may have to just say, look, I'm actually have to need to come in lower. <laughs> and yeah. that's how quickly things are changing in real time. Now, I will say, are you seeing, because I'm getting these brokers telling me it takes the one guy to set the price, right? It takes that one 1031 exchange buyer to pay the premium, and then in the broker's like, oh, look, everything should be at 170 a door or whatever it might be, you know, and it's like, no, that's not, <laughs> that's just one idiot because he had to pay, he had to place his money. But I'm and just, I'm, I'm sort of reiterating this for listeners, but are you seeing that as well? Like to some high flyer just comes in above everyone else and boom, off, the, off, he, it, off he goes, off she goes, and you're like, look, that's, well, that, of that's, course, the, that's the market. <laughs> of, of course, as brokers, um, especially if you're representing the seller, it's our job to maximize the sale for the seller, right? And also to get a deal done. And so if we can attach ourselves and have some tangible uh, you know, data to be able to make our point about pricing, well, then we're definitely going to use that. And so, you know, there's nothing better than if you're trying to sell an asset to have a similar asset sell with the 1031 exchange buyer that was just needing to to pay whatever the asking price was to get the deal done. Um, and so, yeah, that does happen. But I will say that those are few and far between. And what I'm seeing more of is just this stalling between mm. seller and buyer. And there, the sellers are, are trying to hold out and there's always a dialogue in the back of their head. Well, is this going to be a short thing? And are, are, are the Fed going to get this under control? And, and maybe six months from now, those rates are going to come back down or maybe next spring, the rates are going to come back down. Should I just hold on until then? So now what's going to happen is I think those sellers are just going to sit tight. They're not going to take action. And then there's going to be some sellers that are motivated by other uh, issues going on in their world. 
It could be personal issues. And again, we're talking about my brokerage world, which is personal investors, uh, private investors, not syndications, which they make decisions differently than private investors do. Whereas private investors may be in a scenario where, look, I've got, I had a thriving business for the last decade. All of a sudden I'm in a capital crunch and I've got this uh, asset, this 12 plaques or 24 plaques that's got, you know, a million dollars of equity tied up in it that I could access if I sell this asset. So those are the type of sales that I think will be happening, not necessarily out of distress, just because people want more liquidity in their world Mm -hmm. going into a recession. And so I think those are the type of sales you happen. And then once that happens, all it takes is one. And then all of a sudden, those prices are going to start to readjust. Right. And have you started to see the readjustment yet in real time? I haven't. I haven't. haven't? Yeah. Interesting. Interesting. No. Again, I, I think I, I think it will happen. Mm. I think uh, there's just not enough velocity for that to happen this quickly. Mm. Uh, right. What I mean by that is there's just not enough sales happening right now in the market to see a quick adjustment in pricing. Right. But once they start to happen, and maybe this whole recession and and economic challenges that we're in uh, play out, I I think you'll see more and more of that. And that's interesting in the space that you're in. And I like your analogy you mentioned before. You, you you have those private investors who have a thriving business or something else that's going to be a little bit more rocked by, sorry, rocked sooner by higher interest rates or a yeah. recession. Thus, they need to access capital in a certain you know, piggy bank that they've got, i.e. a multifamily complex. Yep. Um, so that, that's, that's very interesting you say, because I do think that is, you're right, you, you're going to have in that smaller space probably a little bit more like, oh crap, I need to get this money out real quick. And, or I'm at a good basis, I can hold, I can survive, who cares? You know what I mean? So now let's flick to the other side of the coin, the syndications. First, I wanna ask, how are you seeing the reception from investors, those passive investors you, 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 you bring in together? How are you seeing their attitude towards investing right now? Yeah, I've seen a pullback, you know, uh, there, there's no sugarcoating it. The reality is I think everybody's feeling this uncertainty and I think investors are just like pausing mm. and trying to read what's going on in the market. Everybody's reading and listening and talking to each other and trying to figure out what this thing is going to look like in the next, you know, uh, 90 to 120 days. And so um, I def- I've i seen a pullback. Um, I think everybody was playing fast and loose with equity in, in the last, you know, the previous two years. And uh, that's been great. Everybody's won for the most part, right? So it was warranted to be aggressive in placing equity. And now I think everybody's just being more conservative and rightly so. And so now it's going to come down to, again, for me, why it's most important to be partnering with really high quality operators that have a track record of success, that have operational chops that can deal with, you know, the challenges in the market and turbulence in the market is I think it's going to come down to those that can really find really good deals and uh, and then aligning yourself with them. And uh, and I think investors are still anxious to place equity because they know it's just dying if it's sitting in their bank account. Mm. And at the same time, they're actually being a little bit more conservative and probably not placing as much as they would have, you know, a year ago. That's right. at least that's sort of high level mm-hmm. uh, boots on the ground. What my experience has been in talking with my investors. Have you placed any equity in, in a syndication in the last six months? Yeah. Oh, you have? yeah. Okay. And the most recent raise was the most difficult. Yeah, yep. significantly. Yep. You know, where where we you know would raise you know a, a million dollars in twenty four to forty eight hours. Uh, that time you know definitely lengthened out. Mm-hmm. No yeah, no, I'm I'm seeing that across the board in, in the masterminds. I'm part of Raise Master. I'm part of my, my my own mastermind. But even with my deals, it had it had this last deal I just closed went pretty quick. But the deal before that in April was definitely a slow a slower deal. And I'm hearing people fall short across the board, can't raise the money. They're losing hard money left hand over fist. Um, this is in the syndication operation space. Um, you know, people who are a little bit inexperienced. So I'm seeing something is happening. You know, we've been still be able to get deals done, um, but but it goes back to, you know, your, your, how you're financing it, how you're putting it on, you know, how aggressive you are with your underwriting, how you know, sure you are with your equity stack. So all those things play into making sure the syndication actually comes to fruition. Uh, it, it's, it's, it's very interesting. And I'm, I'm, I'm watching 
every single day what's happening with interest rates right now and 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 that that you know the disconnect between sellers even in your smaller space we're still having that same issue on sure. this side of the fence with bigger guys who are just like no nah, I want this from I want I want my November pricing from last year and you're like we ain't in November last year, man. Like right. we're in a six and a half percent interest rate environment well, and right I now. Think, I think you're going to see just uh, you've probably already seen it, Reed, but I think you're going to see retrading become significantly more common based upon the fluctuations that are happening with yep. the rate. Yep. It's just it's necessary. It's a necessary component. Before it was looked at as taboo. If you if you retraded, then you know you were you were looked you, down you, on. You, black you mark were told you weren't going to get another deal. Yeah, you, you got that black mark. The reality is retrading is going to happen moving forward, and yep. I think it's going to become more and more common. And so you'll see uh, operators or buyers go ahead and, and initially be willing to take a take a shot at a deal that might be a little bit on the higher end of, of what they can do, mm -hmm. really digging in during due diligence and then coming back around and saying, look, here's the reality. Yep. Let's let's make a deal work, but here's the reality. And I'm also seeing two other things, and I don't know if you're seeing this on a smaller scale, hard money's pulling back. I'm offering less hard money these days because it's just I don't, ne nearly no hard money. And where up the last two, three years, if you didn't own, uh, offer hard money in some markets, up to a million dollars in some markets, you wouldn't even be in the best and final. Right. Right. And, and I, I have retraded on a, on a deal that I did this year. I've retraded twice actually on that one deal um, because interest rates were moving so quickly. Uh, you know, I, I got a rate cap at 6% thinking, we'll never hit that. Guess what? We've hit it. <laughs> I look and I, I had a conversation with an investor who was like, this is highway robbery. Rate caps are highway robberies. And I'm like, looking pretty good right now. <laughs> so, <laughs> right. You know, hey, like, Reed, it, I, I do want to go back on one point. Sure. And I, I want to. Um, I don't want to overemphasize the fact that people are, are pulling back. I think they are, and right. rightfully so. And at the same time, there's also this sense in the conversation I have with my investors, there's also this sense of urgency of still placing equity because yeah. they're, they're, it's not doing them any good to just sit on that cash right now. Yes. And so they are going to hold back more reserves than they have in the past, but there's still this urgency for them to get their equity working for them in a place that they feel is recession resistant. I just want I to will, emphasize that. No, no, yeah, I completely agree with that. Um, uh, I, I do also believe that, and, and my opinion is, we are in a really good time. If you're diligent and you're hanging around the hoop in the correct time, you can actually get some pretty good deals to work right now. There's less competition. There's been probably the less, the least amount of competition for deals this second. Where you mentioned it earlier, velocity of, of of deal flow. So if you have been, if you're listening out there trying to be an active operator or even an investor, you might actually start to see some 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 opportunities come around in the next sort of sixty to one hundred and twenty days. So I, I'm then, very much looking at that as well. And another thing to think about is if you can get a deal under contract now, and if there is an adjustment in rates. Um, for the benefit, uh, dropping lower, that that could be an opportunity. You may be able to take advantage of pricing as it is, uh, you know, adjustments in pricing down as it as they are today, and then have the benefit of interest rates dropping and really being able to take advantage of things. So again, you know, opportunities are times like this is when uh, those that are willing to take on some calculated risks can really win in a in a big way. Right. And, and for those passive investors listening to this show, what you're really taught to indicating to, and, and one of the things, the rules that I have never done in my underwriting is, is look at a refinance throughout a hold. I've never tried to go, oh, come year three, I'm going to refinance 40% of your money and that's going to juice the IRR. I've never done that because it's one, it backs you into a corner. Um, and two, people are going to expect it to happen. If you say I'm going to refinance right. in year three, it comes to year three and you can't, you've got a gun against your head. It's it's not – model a five to seven-year hold with the same debt product and if it works and you've got the refinance right. up your up your sleeve, boom. Now, to your point, there is a good argument to say I'm coming in at a fixed 6% interest rate, but in three years' time I do want to come back. And maybe I'm not replacing – uh, I'm giving you back equity. Maybe I'm just replacing the loan with the lower right. interest rate. Stress testing, obviously. No one has a crystal ball, but that is def I could see that being a, a calculated risk to what you're saying is in the future on a model that you're modeling today for the next five years. Maybe in three years' time, I could come in, replace the current loan with instead of a six and a half, maybe I could go down to a, a five and that, that's going yeah. to change the, the and, that's and to change your the point, And to your point, 
you're buying it based upon it performing for the duration of the hold period, for the duration at, of the business plan. At a if, higher interest rate. Right. right. If you are able to refinance down the road, then it will be a boon for the, the project. That's exactly right. That's it. No, I, I, I could talk about this all day with you, mate. Actually, because it's a very, it's in real time, right? You, you're, you're seeing it on the small end, but I love that fact you've got those boots on the ground, real time uh, anecdotes that are happening. But we're, I'm seeing it on the big end as well. So, yeah. um, so, so, uh, next question is: We come, we're sitting here at the end of September. What's the sort of plan? How are you going to keep the the syndication truck going um, and, and the lo- and the local business going with what's happening in the market? Well, um, personally, we're being really conservative as it relates to the deals that we're willing to jump on board with. Mm -hmm. So um, I've had more deals than I can handle come to us and with operators that would like us to partner with them. Um, But I just haven't seen the I haven't seen the price adjustment necessary for the market today to be interested in moving forward on those deals. Um, I, I will say that there's a couple that we're looking at now, and I think they're really good opportunities. And so they may be coming around the corner for fixed, our investor fixed network. Fixed or floating. What's that? Fixed or floating debt. Uh, we're underwriting both at the moment, and okay. it's, uh, it's a moving target. Mm. So it's that something the that we're exploring piece. right now. It's the hardest yeah. piece. Yeah. So, um, and then uh, what I would say on the brokerage side, it's really helping I mean, these are these are just busy professionals, business owners that own small portfolios, and they're really trying to navigate these waters. And so, I usually on a daily basis, uh, I have investor calls where we're just talking about their portfolio. We're evaluating where they're at. We're evaluating their return on equity. Um, should they consider trying to reposition their equity in one fashion or another? Is it an opportune time to buy if you can find the right opportunity? So we're just having conversations with investors and and trying to help anywhere that we can. That's awesome. What's the number one piece of advice you can give to a passive investor right now, uh, given that you're on both sides of the fence? It takes time to really get to know an operator. So that's my role for my investors is spending time to get to know an operator, their weaknesses, their strengths, their past uh, track record of performance, what their goals are moving forward, what their values are, um, how they're going to deal with difficult situations. And so the challenge for a passive investor, the, the, the number one piece of advice that I would give to a passive investor is take the time necessary to truly know who you're investing with. That's mm-hmm. not easy to do. It takes more time than a lot of passive investors want to put in to it. Um, and so many of them will just place small bets with a lot of different operators. And then based upon their experience, they move forward with those operators that they've had the best experience with. Thus, most of the capital starts to flow to those operators that are performing at a high level. Um, but if you're a new passive investor, it's really taking the time to do your due diligence on the lead sponsor that you plan on investing with. That's right. a hard thing to do, but I think it's important. And you're, you're just purely saying, look at their track record, get to know them, have a few conversations with them, that sort of stuff? Well, it, the hard part is just, yeah, it, you can see, I mean, deal decks come through, they look professional, they look authentic, They look, the, people can attach themselves to someone else's track record in mm-hmm. many cases. And so you may be dealing with the lead sponsor that you know says they've acquired $500 million of real estate, The reality is they may have done one or two deals and may not have ever even been a lead sponsor on that opportunity. And so it's important to really dig a little bit deeper than the uh, the higher level stuff. And if you can get to know someone on a personal level, even better, because you're never going to know um, the true values of an operator without spending time with that person. And that's hard to do. Yep, completely agree. Well, mate, uh, at the end of every show, we like to dive into the top five investing tips. You ready to get into it? Let's do it. Mate, question number one is, what is the daily habit you practice to keep on track towards your goals? Uh, the alarm goes off at 5.30 every morning. Uh, I know that's late for some of you guys out there. Um, 5.30 every morning, me and my wife get up and together we go and uh, get a good CrossFit workout in. And that's the number one thing that I do on, my, uh, on a daily basis that helps me just stay on track with things. 
That's awesome. Question number two is, in who's been the most influential person in your career to date? The most influential person. You know, I would have to, I had a mentor early on. He was the individual. I, I served a church service mission for two years. And uh, the leader of that, uh, that, that mission was uh, a, a very successful real estate broker and investor in his own right. And he was the one that sort of inspired me and pushed me to get into the real estate world. And so uh, that was a long time ago that he got me going that direction. But I would say that's probably been, probably had the biggest impact on my life as, as that individual. Awesome. Question number three has been, is, I should say, is what is the most influential tool in your business? When I say tool, it could be a physical tool like a, a phone or a notebook, or it could be a piece of software that's a tool that you just can't run the business without. What is it? Hmm. That's a good question. You know, I would have to say at this point, it's, uh, I'll give you two. It's the mm -hmm. CRM that I use, which is geared more towards uh, the brokerage world, uh, follow-up boss. Um, that is a very powerful tool, robust tool for, uh, or really for anybody, um, especially small, small scale business. So uh, Follow Up Boss is a fantastic tool that I currently use and, and it literally is the brains behind our business. And then two is the podcast. Um, the podcast uh, has given me an opportunity to network with incredible people like yourself, Reed, and so many other great operators out there that I've had a chance to learn from and dialogue with. And so I think that's the next best tool for me. That's awesome. I completely agree with uh, with CRM and the podcast. Definitely, uh, uh, probably mine as well. If you if you ask me the question backwards, uh, question number four is in one sentence. What's been the biggest failure in your career? And what did you learn from that failure? The biggest failure? Yep. Oof! In one sentence, um, not investing earlier on in my career. Um, you know, I, I mentioned this earlier, and it's a shame. There's too many brokers and agents that are in this space that actually don't invest. Mm. And I was one of those for a decade, you know, had done some minor stuff here and there, but hadn't done nearly enough to put myself and my family on the path that I wanted us to be on. Time flies by, you're doing transactional business, you're making good money, you're living a comfortable life, but you're not really driving your life forward from a wealth and cash flow perspective. And that was the biggest mistake I made was uh, not investing earlier on in my career. Yeah, I completely agree. You, you always got to be placing money every single year, good years, bad years, and, and you'll look back over a long period of time and you know be grateful for that. Mate, last question. Where can people reach you to continue the conversation that will be in your sphere? Where do they want to go? Two things. Um, I'll give them a free resource. We talked a lot about uh, return on equity, right? If you own investment property and you have a significant amount of equity built up, you may be surprised at how low your return on that equity that's tied up in that property is performing. And so if they go to returnonequityreport.com, that's returnonequityreport.com, they can use a free calculator, they can plug in their numbers and within three minutes have a, a report showing what their return on equity is. And then uh, lastly is just uh, reach out to me at canovocapital.com, C-A-N-O-V-O capital.com, canovocapital.com. Awesome stuff, mate. Well, look, I want to thank you so much for jumping on the show today. I want to reflect some of the things that I took away from today's show. I think your ability to keep the business going locally that you're really good at and, and understand what you are good at, but also then tacking on conversations or seeing an opportunity with those conversations to say, hey, I can do more with this in, in the syndication space and be that conduit between people who may want to have some personal portfolio, but also may want to have just some passive investments and, and creating that synergy between what you're doing every day with uh, the syndication space. I think that is is such a, a great synergy of businesses to align together. Uh, I also love the fact that you know you just you just knew, you just know what you're good at, right? You're not going to try and do wear all the hats and you know be the operator and be the the mechanical engineer. You know you're gonna you're gonna be good at what you what you, what you put on this earth to do. Um, and and I, I I love the conversation around about the velocity in the market right now. A lot of people I think will re uh, rewind this show and listen to what you have to say about the expectations between sellers and buyers and what we're seeing not only locally in your market, but also what I'm seeing on my end of the uh, end of the spectrum and then where we're headed to in the future. Um, mate, did I leave anything out? No, I think that's great, man. I appreciate you having me on, Reed. It's been great. Awesome, brother. Well, look, I want to thank you so much for jumping on the show. Enjoy the rest of your week and we'll catch up very, very soon. Thank you very much.
Well, there you have another cracking episode jam-packed with some incredible advice from David. If you want to check him out, remember, it's returnoneequityreport.com or you can head over to canovacapital.com. Check him out. He's doing some incredible stuff in his local market, but also in the syndication space, connecting passive investors with incredible opportunities. I want to thank you all again for listening to this show and tuning in each and every week to grow your financial IQ because that's what we're all about here on this show. If you do like this show, the easiest way to give back is to give it a five-star review and you're going to find all the show notes from today's show up on my website at reedgoosens.com. We're going to do this all again next week. So remember, be bold, be brave, and go give life a crack.